welcome on stage, CEO and co-founder of Magnolia, Pascal Michael. <laughs> So this is actually not ACDC, what you see right here. This is Tony Ramon from the Ramones. For those who have been at the concert, welcome to the Magnolia Conference 2015. It's great to have you all here today. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what we have done over the last year. So why rock and roll? Magnolia feels sometimes just like a rock band. Really crazy people, creative people who want to create something new, something special, something outstanding, a product that is awesome to be used by partners, by clients. So it wasn't such an easy thing always to do that. It took us years, years to do what we have done right now, to create the Magnolia brand. And two years ago, we released Magnolia 5 we truly created something, something amazing. But Magnolia CMS is something that might be a little bit outdated. That, you know, CMS, the, 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 the name content management system is something. So we were thinking, how can we name it? How can we brand it? How can we rebrand it or reposition Magnolia? So Magnolia is actually for a new age. It's for, made for the digital transformation. So we are calling it not Magnolia CMS anymore. We are calling it Magnolia, a digital business platform with a CMS at its core. And this is extremely important because it's, we are able to do small and extremely large projects with Magnolia and not only websites. I come to that later. So the, bis the digital business strategy that we have and that we are going to announce today is something very important for us. So we have actually in our ecosystem, in the world's ecosystem, we have the open source and community driven content management systems, just like Drupal, everybody knows it, Joomla, Typo3 and so on. But they are community driven and they have usually no vendor support. On the other hand, we have the vendor supported, vendor driven, closed suites. So the thing is that, you know, like you can't use them as accurate as an open source software. Uh, we were thinking, and Boris and me, we are both open-minded people. You know, we'd like to have open standards, you know, regular things that you can take from communities, from Apache Foundation and so on. So we took actually from both worlds the best into our product. And we call it the open suite approach. It's vendor driven, so you have the support, and it's still open source and open standardized. So our strategy is the open suite approach. Let's go a little bit further. Of course, this multi-channel inbound and multi-channel outbound thing is always where we were very strong at. The digital business platform is something that is more and more beyond a CMS. But of course, a CMS is very important for us and for, for most of the clients. So CMS is still the part of what we deliver right now. And it's actually not only a CMS, it's an operating system for your digital initiatives. So we have a templating framework, we have an app framework, we have a UI framework, we have an integration framework, and personalization, of course, introduced with 5.3 last year. And we have the collaboration. So it's much more than a CMS. That's why we call it a digital business platform. So what are the offerings? So we have the on-premise. We introduced that in 2006. That's the regular license that you can get from Magnolia. So you buy the license, you install it wherever you like it. We have the hosted environment. Hosted is provided by a lot of our partners. We have certified hosts that you can install the software on. We have, for example, Rackspace and IBM who are certified Magnolia partners for the hosted environment. But we were thinking beyond. When we introduced Magnolia 1.0, we had 
uh, an installer shipped with it. 12 years ago, that was very cool, an open source uh, software with an installer, so you were able to use the software and to start uh, digging into it. But nowadays, everything is in the cloud. Everything is SaaS, software as a service. Everything is immediately available. So the on-demand solution that we are announcing today will be in beta stage to try out starting today. Daniel Lipp, who is the third speaker in our keynote sessions, will talk lots more about the on-demand solution. So when we are talking about the strategy, about the platform, about the offering, there is something missing. We have the digital business services that are missing. What does that mean, the digital business services? So Magnolia provides all the tool sets and all the consulting services to get you up to speed, to enable you to use Magnolia as a software. So there is, there is training, there is support, certification, consulting. So for all for the tricky projects and the projects getting more and more tricky nowadays and more and more integrated into very complex environments, but that's not all. As you all know, Magnolia is not providing any project implementation services. That's what we started in 2006 to partner with implementation service companies, with agencies, with media agencies. And they are a very, very important uh, part of this ecosystem. So when you talk about all these kind of things together, then we talk about the digital business ecosystem of Magnolia. Yeah, so we have the hosted, the on-demand, the on-premise on one side. We have the services and partner on the other side. And we have the inbound and outbound. Means like you can connect with our connectors that we already ship with Magnolia or that are available. You can connect tons of systems all around. And you can use all these uh, use cases to do whatever you want to do with Magnolia. Boris will talk about the Internet of Things later on after my talk, and he will show you how Magnolia can out of the box use different kind of technologies within and, you know, is prepared for all what's going to become. So, that's all nice. We have the ecosystem, but what's all about when why do we have actually these big partners? Um, Tata Consulting Services won four projects over the last 12 months. Those four projects are really big, and we are happy that we have these kind of partners to fulfill the needs of our clients to do the big projects, and especially when it comes into Asia. The Asian market, we don't have that much partners there right now, and they are present, they are in India, and they are building up 250 CMS developers, educating them in Pune, India, just for Magnolia. And this is an amazing thing. Why is this happening? This is happening because of they think that it's so much more uh, has so much more advantages using Magnolia than big companies' software uh, because they can use it in smaller steps. They can use less risky projects, faster results, less cost, and with less risk, you most probably are more successful than when you have to do a full project that takes for two years. So smaller cycles, less uh, costs, faster results. And we see that with a lot of clients right now. We have a lot of big brands that are jumping on the bandwagon with Magnolia, and they are telling us it's the reason they can start small, but scale with almost no limits. We have a strategic technical partnership with IBM. With IBM. Uh, the technical partnership with IBM is, gives us the, 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 the power to enable IBM with our uh, platform. So our platform is the main part to publish, manage, and connect all the IBM infrastructure they have. 
So they were looking long time or in the market to have a look if there is a platform that you know can <clears throat> can can use uh, all their infrastructure without changing the infrastructure. And this is the most important point. We have such a flexible infrastructure, a such a flexible platform that you can plug it in with ease. So we are very happy with this technical partnership. So when we go to the next point, we have a lot of big wins this year. Probably you know some of those. It's Ancestry, it's Credit Plus, Invesco, very big uh, investment company, Lotto Quebec. After five or six years using the Community Edition, they finally switched to Enterprise Edition. And why is this happening? This is happening because they started small, with a small implementation and rolled it out through the whole company. Now they want to have the vendor support, they want to have the, the, the power of Magnolia in the back, and consulting services as well. Post office in the UK, Togolino, for those who have children here in Europe, uh, German-speaking ones, they know this. Uh, our children are watching all the time the Togolino channel. Uh, Symphony, a Swiss uh, insurance company, and Weight Watchers, a big brand, everybody knows it. But we have some key wins this year. And I'd like to talk about a little bit about the key wins. We have the BCA, it's the Bank Central of Asia. It's a very big bank, and it's actually the first financial customer in Asia that we were able to win. And this is crucial because I'm talking later on what we are going to build up in uh, the Asian market for the Asian market. We have won Deloitte. Deloitte, as the main website, uh, is using Magnolia. Exactly the same point. They started small, they can scale to whatever needs they have. And, you know, for all future uh, initiatives, they can plug in whatever they need. We have one Generali group worldwide. So what, that, what does that mean? That means that not only Switzerland or Italy or France is now on Magnolia, but the whole world is going to go on Magnolia. I think it's roughly 120 to 150 websites that they're going to manage with it. And this is really cool because we see this happening all the time. <coughs> that large companies are switching to Magnolia. And last but not least, we have one Samsung United States. This is, as all everybody knows, and probably some of you have not an iPhone, but a Samsung uh, device, uh, this is something which really gives me the feeling that we are there, that we can replace existing systems, ex existing um, closed suites, our competitors' vendor um, systems for those big companies. They start small and they can scale wherever they want to scale. So, I'd like to give you some updates about what happened during the year. We have a, a compound annual growth rate of 31% over the last four years, including 2014. So if you compare this to co the compound annual growth rate of uh, the global VCM market, so that's quite a difference. So it's really more than what the market usually uh, grows. We have our revenue numbers consolidated over the United States and Switzerland is 8.9 million. So it reflects exactly those 31%. And not only the 31% of our revenue growth is happening, so we have like almost 75 people that are working for Magnolia additionally. So this growth rate is almost the same than with our revenue growth. So Boris and me uh, went last year, uh, when, what was it, like May, uh, to Vietnam. We had a great relation, uh, we have a great relationship with someone that builds up teams there, and we are happy to have a team of almost 15 people in Vietnam. This will be our hub for dev and support for the Asian market. You have to be there. I mean, we saw it with the United, within the United States. 
We have to have local support, local people that speak the languages, that understand the Asian culture, in the United States, of course, the US American culture. And it's really a diff difference. If I would go, I mean, it wouldn't match. The US Americans are different. And this is important. That's why we are building up this hub. It might be that we are going to do sales initiatives there as well. But let's see what the time is telling us. So, next, we have a new website, finally. And it's not only green anymore, it looks a little bit green here, but it's not only green anymore, so it's lighter, it's fresh. It's the way we want to have our sales efforts reflected. And this is so important for us, it's not this kind of closed, uh, uncomfortable thing. It's really open. It has an opened, open images. Go and have a look. Nice case studies. Really compelling website. We have five three released last year. Five three. The major part was personalization, and I can announce that we have forty percent adoption rate of our clients on Magnolia 5.3. This is amazing when you know how difficult it is for moving from 4.4 to 5.3 or 5.4. So a lot of people took that effort because it, Magnolia 5.3 has so much more in it than, it than our old Magnolia 4.4 had. I'd like to announce today Magnolia 5.4 Beta. 5.4 Beta has a new templating engine in it. So we are getting slowly but surely, for those who know Magnolia perfectly, uh, our own templating framework, the SDK, will be you know, put on the side, and everybody can use their templating uh, frameworks of choice. We are as much as I know, we are uh, creating a new demo, and you see here the new demo. It's the Magnolia Travels. It's not actually a company that we did. So it's a, it's a website, a demo website, and, um, and it's done with Bootstrap, and it shows how content apps can be used within Magnolia so that you have the full power of the platform in Magnolia, and you see what you can achieve with it. We have ease of development. That was one part that was one of the most important parts that people told us, please be simpler in the development. Don't have like only Java developers that can develop on Magnolia and with Magnolia. And it's so cool that you are now, the whole front-end framework requires no Java uh, development skills anymore. So more people can use it, and it's easier to find those people for partners and, of course, for clients. We have dynamic page caching, a campaign publisher, and lots of other enhancements. Philippe Barfuers, our CTO, will talk later on, I think after our talk, about the Magnolia 5.4 achievements. Um, last year, I was talking about our new office. We are thrilled that we can soon move from where we are. For those who have been to our office in Basel, I mean, it's a great office with a great terrace. But this office has lots of space. You see Auntie looking at the roof. And you see, that it's so amazing. And last but not least, we have a great terrace there as well. It's not the River Rhine, actually, I know. It's a little bit urban, but, um, <laughs> but it's cool to be there. And you're all invited to see the new terrace and to see our new Magnolia campus in Dreispitz area. So it's a long way to the top if you want to rock and roll. So everything is rock and roll. And with its products, I think Magnolia will rock more than ever. Use Magnolia for all your digital initiatives and small or enterprise, and be prepared for the digital transformation that is happening right now. And remember, the four, first one now will later be last for the times they are changing. I thank you very much, and I'd like to announce Boris Kraft on the floor. It's my business partner and CVO.
He has visions beyond what you have expected <laughs> to be possible with Magnolia. Thank you very much. And thank you, Pascal. Thanks, man. Thank you. Great talk. All right, I was hoping that Pascal would give me a little bit more time to relax, but here I am. <laughs> thank you all. Let me get to the next slide here. Thank you all for being here today. There we are. And um, it's amazing to see you all. You know, this room is packed. Uh, we managed to get even more people into this room than last year. Thanks for those are, that are standing here. And if I think back to the first conference that we did, I'm, I'm actually happy to see some of the faces from back then here today. Um, seven, I think seven years ago. Yes, six or seven years ago. Then um, a lot has changed since then. And my talk today will be a lot about changes and how they affect us and especially how they affect you and how we support you to deal with these changes. Starting with myself, you know that last year we introduced the new management team and I started as a developer with Magnolia and then went on to become its CTO for many years and CMO, uh, so responsible for the marketing. And actually, right now, I am uh, the acting CMO for various reasons. So if you know a, g a great CMO, send them to us. But since last year, my role is the chief visionary officer, right? And for, with that role, I'm responsible for the strategic outlook. Luckily, I don't have to worry as much about if we make payroll or not, because that's really Pascal's job, right? So my role has changed. Magnolia has changed. Pascal referred to it from being a simple yet very ambitious content management system that we started out in 2003 to become a full-blown digital business platform, something that our clients are using a lot and that uh, makes a lot of sense because of what is happening these days. And finally, of course, our world keeps changing, right? And right now, what is really interesting, in a sense, and that's why we're all here, it's changing from an analog to a digital world, and we call this the digital transformation. So my talk today will really be about the digital transformation. I'll give in, uh, an example as much as I have time for it, and I will explain why exactly this is happening now and why it's relevant now, why we're interested in this right now. Also, of course, how it will affect you and how Magnolia helps. I will reiterate some of the things that Pascal said, just to make sure you all get them, right? And finally, um, I'll talk about IoT as a use case that shows how flexible Magnolia has been built as a platform to deal with these challenges, to deal with challenges like the Internet of Things and, of course, with the opportunities that come with it. So what is the digital transformation? Well, as I just said, you can think of it as going from analog to digital. But transformation also means it affects us. It affects us as organizations and as individuals. And it's been going on actually for quite a while, um, ever since we introduced computers, basically, and started to um, you know, uh, improve our processes. So in the area of enterprises, there are really three key areas that digital transformation affects. That's customer experience, it's the operational processes, and business models. And with digital transformation, a lot of business models are, of existing business models are in danger. So the interesting part also is that there are lots of new opportunities, new types of innovation and creativity coming with the digital transformation. And another thing is maybe we're actually already in the middle of it, right? But it's accelerating. And it's affecting all of us. So let me give you an example where you wouldn't necessarily expect it. This company here, you know, you see this uh, tractor, combine harvester, heavy machinery, is the company John Deere, the world leader in farming equipment. And it's quite interesting because you'd think, well, you know, these guys are a little bit, you know, backyard type of, but that's actually not true. It's amazing what they're doing. There's tons of technology in these machines, and there's actually a lot of discussion going on at the moment about if it's more software than hardware that they're having. But what is more relevant from our perspective looking at digital transformation is really that they've invested roughly a billion dollars into becoming more digital, and they're aiming to, re to have 20% of their revenue just from digital services. Things they introduced are, for instance, a platform to connect 
um, pretty much everything that affects farming to make it more efficient. So they connect a lot of sensors, uh, GPS information, they can measure the, the humidity and the nutrition in the soil and um, connect with sprinkler systems and weather forecasts to completely automate what is happening in the farming. So that's uh, Field Connect, their platform. So this is definitely an example of where you find innovation from digital transformation in areas where you wouldn't necessarily assume they are. So the next big question is, you know, why is it happening now? And I think this is key to understand. Um, so we can say, yeah, it's been going on forever. Why is Boris talking about this, right? Well, I think I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. And let me give you a quick overview of why this is happening, why I think it's happening now. So, in a sense, it all started for us with the World Wide Web. Introduction of the World Wide Web, built on open standards on the infrastructure of the Internet, right? And with this came the possibility to publish content for anybody. And you just, you know, if, if you think about it, that's revolu revolutionary, but uh, today we think it's just normal. But also to have free access to information pretty much everywhere on this planet. And um, this in turn spawned, uh, you know, a group of, let's say, or, or generation of digital natives, right? People that grew up with this access to information, with the ability to um, work uh, directly and publish directly, to blog or to use social media to connect with each other, right? 2007 saw the launch of the iPhone, and that was really the breakthrough for smartphones. And this is interesting because it changed the dynamics again in terms of digital transformation. So last year alone, 1.2 billion smartphones were sold on this planet. And that's an insane number if you think about it. And each one of these phones is stock full, chock full, sorry, chock full with um, sensors, logic, and connectivity. And these are the three ingredients we need for the Internet of Things. Well, I'll talk a lot more about the Internet of Things, but the price has dropped so much from you know, producing all these phones that sensors today are really costing cents and not dollars, and that's why we can put them into everything. And um, we have Josh here, Josh Wellman, he'll give a talk later on. Um, he is at the forefront of such developments and will show you some of the use cases and I'm really glad to have him. I'm really looking forward to that talk. So the characteristics of the digital transformation, really you see this picture here of a perfect storm, very rare um, situation actually. It has two aspects. One is disintermediation, and <clears throat> sorry, the other one is dematerialization, two very kind of complex words for more or less um, you know, simple things. Disintermediation means we're cutting out the middleman, right? So whereas previously people would control a channel and make money of controlling that channel, now we can just forget about them. And that's really dangerous. And we've seen this, dangerous for them and great for us, of course. We've seen this with the record industry, for instance. So previously, if you wanted to record something, you'd go and sign a deal with the record company and they would control the distribution channel, right? That's, of course, no longer true. You can just record whatever you want in your home studio, on your you know, iMac or whatever you have, and just publish it on the web without asking anybody. And dematerialization, on the other hand, is really about digitizing stuff. And because you have digitized it, you can copy it basically for free, and you can distribute it basically for free over the Internet. Right? And we have seen how that changes the dynamics of the markets. Right? So now you can buy books without ever getting a physical book. You can listen to streaming music. Um, you have Netflix instead of um, the old you know, uh, VHS tapes that you would have rented at the corner store. So this has disrupted a lot of businesses. And actually, this is um, one of, these are some of the characteristics here. So it's really uh, you know, being able to disrupt what is happening getting into the area of new business models and seeing that digital becomes sometimes more relevant than physical. And um, also, I want to talk a little bit that we're living in a post-scarcity society. We're living in an age of abundance. We have a lot of stuff, right? A lot of information. So, for instance, uh, in earlier times, the newspaper controlled the channel 
And um, because it was expensive to print and distribute newspapers, they put a lot of different stuff into these newspapers so that they could sell more uh, newspapers so you'd find you, the bit that interests you. You know, maybe it's culture or maybe it's sports, um, whatever it was. But, you, you know, you get, if, if you ever read the New York Times, you know, it's like a phone book and especially the weekend edition. And uh, it's just crazy. You, you cannot read all of this. But as we all know, a lot of things have changed because of uh, the, the disintermediation here, because we all have access to information all the time, and because, because we have a lot of stuff. And that's actually giving rise to the sharing economy. And that uh, brings us also back to social media, which is really an important factor there. Good, so potential for massive disruption. And I want to give you um, one example right now, and that's Craigslist. It's not a brand new example, but it's a very, very interesting example. Craigslist was founded in, uh, in the 90s uh, by a guy named Craig. And really all he said was, I want to be able to publish classifieds, small advertisements, right? Um, on the web. I don't want to go and call my newspaper or, you know, fill out a letter, a form, sending this to the newspaper and saying, can you please publish the classified ad and pay them, I don't know, five or eight dollars or not, and then wait until it's actually printed and distributed. That's a very strange model, right? So his idea was, why don't we just do classifieds on the web? And, um, well, it actually worked. Uh, it worked very well, and it worked in a way that the existing media really didn't uh, cope well with, because he managed to deflate the classifieds market by $5 billion between 2000 and 2007 alone. And that excludes the three largest newspapers in the US. This is just US numbers. Now, $5 billion is a lot of money, you know? They were suddenly missing from the media industry. And uh, we all know how they all died over the last years. If you don't, well, uh, it's really interesting what's happening there. The most interesting part for us here and for anybody who runs a business that controls a channel and makes money by controlling channels, it only took 30 people to deflate this market by $5 billion. This money is gone. It's nowhere, right? It's just not being spent anymore for advertisements. And that's why all the newspapers, they cannot do anything about it. They made a lot of money from classifieds. No, they don't. They run out of business. Now, two, let's say, more recent examples that are very interesting in the sense of digital transformation. And one is Airbnb. And um, how many of you have actually used Airbnb to stay somewhere? Just raise your hands, please, and give me an example. So it's about half of you. I can recommend it. It's a fantastic service. It's actually so good that I believe every other business that tries to do the same thing will go out of business. So they have been attacking, in a sense, the hotel business and uh, the rental, uh, or would you say the holiday rental business, simply by providing people the ability to post whatever, you know, free room uh, rooms they would have, apartments they have, second homes that they would have, ships that they have that they don't need, um, trailers, whatever, you know. Um, you can actually, you know, stay in on a boat in London. I did this at a uh, canal. It was really, really nice. I recommend that as well. So Airbnb really is the largest hospitality provider on the planet right now. And they're the largest hospitality provider without owning any property you think about that, right? So this is digital transformation. You know, it's possible because you have these smartphones, you go into your room, you take a couple of pictures, you upload it to Airbnb, you connect all of this with social media, which builds trust, right? So people can rate the, land, uh, can, uh, rate the landlords, and uh, also landlords, of course, will give comments about the people that um, rented their rooms. And this way you build up trust, and so this is how you can actually give away your apartment to people. And I think this is an, a brilliant example. And the other one that everybody has heard about probably is Uber. Very similar in a sense. This is actually, from my perspective, an Internet of Things company. Uber is only possible because of the mobile phones and the sensors that we have. And if you've ever taken an Uber, it's an amazing experience. I've been driving cabs a lot around the world, and it can be quite a nuisance, right? With Uber, I can rate the driver, and they can rate me. 
That's very good, because if I call an Uber on my phone, you know, I just press a button, I can see who's there and I can accept or reject this guy and say, no, no, he's, you know, he's not good enough for me. I've been driving with uh, uh, cab drivers through Brooklyn, through, you know, residential areas with kids playing and whatnot, going like 60 miles an hour or something. I was like, I'm never going to make it out alive, right? So with Uber, this cannot happen anymore. And again, Uber is a company that doesn't own cars, you know? It's the largest transportation organization, probably, in the world. But they don't own any cars. So think about that, you know. What do all the taxi drivers do that have these expensive call centers and the expensive old-style technology? Um, it's all not needed anymore. If you, go in, if, you take, if you download the app from Uber, you say, I need to go from here to here, the car comes up, you step in, you step out, that's it. You don't need to pay, you don't need to talk to anybody. You can keep looking, you know, with the heads down generation and post pictures of yourself. I'm using Uber. Anyways, <laughs> so... Of course, what I'm pointing at are we have a lot of challenges here for businesses, right? Let me start with this. Uh, do you have the right people? Obviously, always a question we should ask ourselves. But even more importantly, interestingly enough, are they empowered to act? This is organizational stuff here. And I give you a small example of this, most, one of the most iconic brands um, in the 20th century in the US, Kodak, right? So. They, you know, interestingly enough, they did have the right people. Kodak invented the digital camera. I don't know how many of you know that, but I think that's an amazing fact. Uh, they invented the digital camera, but they couldn't disrupt themselves. They, they didn't want to cannibalize their existing business, the film business, film-based business, right? They were making films mainly before that. They said, well, if we sell digital cameras, we cannot sell films anymore. Well, guess what? Somebody else started selling digital cameras, right? So they couldn't produce film anymore. They went out of business, right? And that, and that happened really quickly, just like we saw with the newspapers. And that's another example of dematerialization, right? No more film, it's just digital. You can copy this stuff, you, do, you send it around the world. So it's all connected. <clears throat> so this was the example for people, for having the right people, but not empowering them and, and being afraid of what is happening, right? And then, of course, we have this uh, famous compass from Jack Sparrow, right? Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, it points you to the thing that you want most in the world. I don't know if you've seen that, but it's a very interesting compass. And the problem is, do you really know what you want? And can you even know how to get there, right? And that's, for me, a really interesting question, because I tell you, you can't know. Right? Why not? Here are three reasons that, or three examples why I think you can't. One is accelerated change, and this is how I started my talk. Right? Everything is changing, it's changing faster. And if you have long implementation cycles and long you know, waterfall models of implementing projects where you say, oh, three years from now we're going to ship this app and it's going to change everything, by that time you're out of business. Right? Very simple. You have to be very agile to manage this. And then um, the MarTech landscape slide, something that's been around for a couple of years now, uh, last year's edition, showing just marketing technology vendors, has 1,876 companies on it. You know, which products do you want to choose? Who of them will even survive the next six months? Right? There's no way of knowing. So you have to have systems that support this agility, this change. And of course, time to market is ever more important, right? You have to be fast, you have to be able to implement new ideas quickly and then see them fail if they fail and iterate over it until you find something that actually works. And finally, the kind of third, third big area where digital transformation affects organizations or process challenges and opportunities is customer experience, right? And customer experience uh, can mean different things to different people, but basically it, might, it means providing utility to your customers, right? Something of value and making it easy for them to engage with you. And to do that, you really need a lot of integrations to backend systems, right? You can have a nice web page or a nice app that says, we are great, but actually that's not what your customers are interested in, right? They want to have transactional um, conversations with you, if you want. 
And some of our customers, and that brings me back to the digital business platform, they're doing exactly that. If you go to Thomas Cook and book, uh, book a, a journey right, to somewhere, book apartments and so on, you have all the context. It's all connected to backend systems, and you have a conversation with them where they can say, oh, you know, last year you stayed here, here's something similar, you might like try a different destination. They, the, the better they know you, the more they can serve you, but it's all about connections, and this is all about this double funnel right, that we've talked about in the past. And also for customer experience, there is the user interface part. And the user interface part is a lot about front-end technologies, right? And that brings me back to where I started saying, um, you know, what has happened? Why is digital transformation so relevant now? With the rise of the web, we standardized a lot of technologies like JavaScript, HTML, and CSS that are now used to provide you with great user experience. To do that, you need developers, and not only developers, but in a sense, you need artists, right? It's not easy to do customer experience, right, or a user interface or user interaction design, right? It's actually almost more an art form than a science. So, you know, where do you find these people? How can you keep them? How can you retain them? The user experience will become, and already is for many businesses, a decisive and distinctive factor in how successful they are. If you just look at the, let's say, your bank account and how you interact with them, you might know that there are very different ways of, of doing this. You know, some force you to enter numbers into some calculator thing and then enter a pin and then enter that number into your, into your screen before you're even logged in, stuff like that. You know, drives you crazy, drives me crazy at least. So, you know, get better developers uh, is what you want, but they're not easy to get. And in a sense, front-end is the new back-end. So what used to be hard, the back-end stuff, the Java, the heavy lifting, all the integration stuff, it's still hard, of course, but people focus more on the front-end, and that is why with Magnolia 5.4, we introduced uh, the Magnolia templating essentials that allow developers to really work without Java, actually, and work with whatever framework they like right now. And that's a really, really cool step forward for developers and for organizations that want to build great customer experiences. So I already, in a sense, talked a lot about how we help here. Um, but you can think of Magnolia as an operating system for the digital transformation, right? And if you think about that, an operating system abstracts from the, uh, from the differences of the underlying systems that you have, and it provides common services. And that's exactly what Magnolia does. Uh, Pascal showed you on his slide a lot of the different building blocks that we have. And um, they allow you to do things like unifying your digital infrastructure, right? This is what IBM is doing with Magnolia. Same for SAP or companies like that. It's old school stuff. And with Magnolia, you can have a layer above that old school stuff that gives you a unified uh, experience there and empowers uh, your employees. So also unified touch points, that's the funnel out thing we do, no matter uh, which uh, device you're using, if you're using a smart TV or in-car entertainment system, uh, it's all you know, unified, the same brand experience, really, really important. And we're empowering the employees here by making it really simple to use Magnolia, by having a user interface that looks the same no matter what you do, but also by providing collaboration services like our messages and tasks and workflow. And of course, to make this digital infrastructure easy to use, um, we unify and, and give you all these connectors, right? And Pascal also mentioned the open suite approach. This is, you know, a vendor supported best of breed, basically. We are making it, we're building a product, we're prioritizing building the product so that you can plug in all that infrastructure and go step by step forward with your projects. Well, all of this points to agility. And this brings me back to what I just said in terms of challenges. We built Magnolia to be the most flexible product on the planet in, in this space. And we have independent analysts that stated clearly Magnolia is the most flexible product on the planet. And this is why, if we need to cope with all these changes in the market, we can adapt really quickly. You can adapt really quickly, you know? And with 5.4, it's even greater because you can use more of your existing resources and say, okay, we need to do this app, we need to drive this app, we need to do a new website, or we need to unify our global brand experience uh, in a fast way. 
I'll quickly talk, and I think I uh, need some, some time here. I'll quickly talk about um, the ecosystem that Pascal mentioned, just going through this. Just to reiterate, we have the connectors that connect you to, to, to uh, customer, um, to, to CRMs, uh, that connects you to lots of e-commerce systems, etc. So you can just plug them into Magnolia. We have apps to extend the functionality. We have our new software as a service offering. We have um, also, the academy where you can learn no matter where you are in the world, you can learn for free how to use Magnolia and how to, how to, to develop in Magnolia. Fantastic partner network to help you get these projects up uh, quickly. And uh, last but not least, the Internet of Things support. And this is kind of the, the last part of my talk now. Internet of Things is for me, really interesting. During the last year, I did a lot of research about it, and I got really excited, right? I got really excited. Maybe I was just late, and everybody else was excited before me. But anyways, I think we have something here that is amazing and will change a lot of things. So first of all, um, the Internet of Things is a big driver for digital transformation, and I'll talk about it why. And um, of course, Magnolia is here to help you um, you know, make the best out of the Internet of Things for you. And I'll show you uh, our support for the Internet of Things as an example of no matter what happens on this planet, you know, it could be any new technology, anything that, that changes and drives, drives you crazy in the sense of how can we get this done, you can cope with it using Magnolia in a way where we don't need to change the platform. So, the Internet of Things, you can say, is an API for the real world. I mentioned earlier on, sensors have become cheap. Logic has become cheap, connectivity has become cheap. We can plug this stuff into every seat in the cinema and know if it's occupied or not, right? It becomes so cheap. And with all this data, you can do a lot of interesting stuff. You could also say it's simply things with sensors, connectivity, and logic that communicate, right? So there will be an awful lot of this because it's become so cheap. Here we have a number of 30 billion by 2020. And we can put them anywhere, like in this ship, for instance, where they're actually using it. Uh, they're using sensors and logic and connectivity. They're also using Magnolia, by the way. Um, so there is, you know, it, it, there's a lot of potential for new ideas, for new business models, for transforming what has been done before by using this. New business models in the sense of, the, for instance, the sharing economy, but also in the sense of usage-based models where you say, because we can measure exactly what you're doing, you can pay per use instead of buying something and then we have no clue what is happening. And uh, John Deere, for instance, is using it to predict failure of these big machines, right? They know something is wrong before you know it. And they're able to ship, uh, you know, spare parts or uh, alert the service team or whatnot to make sure that your farming equipment never fails. And that is relevant, very relevant for them. The Internet of Things also will get us more from con content, static content, if you want, into conversations. This is where we all want to be, right? This is what brands want to do. Um, and this is by being more, becoming more personalized. The more sensors we have, the more we know about our customers, the more personal we can get. And you can all expect that in the next couple of years, we'll have technology on our phones that basically tells us what we want before we even know it. Might sound scary, but it will happen, you know, as, as, as always. If it's there, it will happen. So here's our support, right? This is the Magnolia Beacon app. And, um, you know, if you've seen that we have installed beacons here. So if you walk around later on, you can try this out a little bit. And it's just an app. We can just add it to Magnolia. We didn't need to change anything in Magnolia. Now you can manage Beacon, register them with Magnolia, and use the location, the indoor location information to personalize what you say, how you communicate. And of course, this is also supported by other things like location management, so we know where those beacons are. Or, for instance, a coupon um, app that allows you to generate coupons and um, you know, use that for, uh, for commercial reasons here. Please, again, if you don't have done so already, download the app. Um, this is an, an amazing example. It's all done in Magnolia. It's powered by Magnolia and it has beacon support, so it gives you immediate access to play around with that. So, as you can think, uh, as you can see, we think that the Internet of Things and Magnolia as a digital business platform, they fit very well together, that we can really support interesting use cases. And actually, we think it's so exciting that we produced a video, and I want to show you this video. 
Daniel has an awesome designer's store, but how can he provide an even better customer experience to increase his revenue? With Magnolia as his digital business platform, he can easily integrate beacons into the shopping experience. It only takes a few seconds for him to create a coupon on his tablet for a new designer bag. He doesn't even have to leave Magnolia to add a picture to the product information. To engage regular customers who walk by, he sets up an entrance beacon with a personal offer they can't resist. Anna loves Daniel's store and has its app installed on her phone. When she walks by, her phone detects the entrance beacon signal. The app asks Magnolia for the action assigned to this beacon. Magnolia communicates with connected back-end systems to find out Anna's favorite designer. Magnolia also checks which products are in stock and which ones Anna has already bought. It selects the designer's latest bag as the most likely option to prompt a buy. The app displays her personal discount. Anna enters the store to have a closer look at the bag. The beacon next to the product prompts the display of additional information and trends about the bag. Anna learns that her favorite pop singer was seen with the same bag last week. Of course, she wants it. Daniel scans the coupon displayed on Anna's phone to apply Anna's personal discount. Anna has found just the product she wanted, all thanks to a great new shopping experience. With minimal effort, Daniel has gained a satisfied customer. Simply by using Beacons and Magnolia, the digital business platform with a CMS at its core. All right, thank you. I hope you like this. Um, let me summarize quickly uh, what I talked about today. Digital transformation is happening, right? It's been happening for a while, but it's accelerating now. And the Internet of Things is a massive driver there. And the Internet of Things is possible basically because we're selling so much mobile phones, right? In your um, Magnolia is a digital business platform, as we heard, um, and we still have this fantastic CMS as the basis for it, because this is how you connect with your customers, right? But you need more than the CMS to get started in this digital world. And we can think of Magnolia as an operating system for the digital transformation. Finally, Internet of Things and our support for it is really a proof point of the platform of the digital business strategy that we have, right? So even if you think, I don't need the Internet of Things, I will never use it, I, whatever, I mean, even, you know, John Deere is using it, so think again. But even if you think you will not be there in this space, it still is an example of how you can cope with these challenges. So, um, yeah, with that, I think I want to get Pascal back up on stage. Pascal, thank you very much uh, for listening to this. Hello. Yeah. Good. Ready. <laughs> so uh, we would like to thank especially the people who organized this event. It's a massive work that uh, has to be spent to do this event. I would like to have a big thank you to all our Magnolia employees who were not able to sit in chairs today <laughs> because they were uh, sitting back there. Uh, next time we're going to book the other floor as well. So thank you very much for everything and I hope you enjoy the day. Exactly. And oh yeah, there's one more thing. Um, you know, we really like the Internet of Things, if I didn't mention it. We have a beacon <laughs> for every one of you. Just pick it up anytime during the conference um, at the reception desk, download Magnolia and play around with the apps that you saw and impress us with the use cases you come up with. Thank you very much. And uh, we wish you both a beautiful day. Thank you. Bye-bye.